That's our prayer today. Um, man, God is, God is available. And um, if you're available to God today, will you just shout amen real loud? We are in our second installment of Enjoy Your Life. It's a study we're doing through the book of Philippians. And I wanna dive straight into it. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, Philippians chapter two. Uh, if you have your workbooks, you can turn there as well. That was today's reading. So if you didn't read it, you can take notes there. We also gave you some sermon notes. You're gonna wanna pull those out. But Philippians chapter two, before we dive in, can we just welcome our online family right now watching online? Thank you guys. All right. Philippians chapter two, here's what it says, verse one through four. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Help me announce my sermon title today. Find a neighbor, one that looks like they need some joy in their life. Come on, find a neighbor and look at them and say, if you wanna enjoy your life, you gotta check yourself. Come on, turn to the neighbor and tell them before you wreck yourself. Come on, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Let's, uh, let's pray together and if you would, would you extend a hand towards heaven just as a sign of openness, availability, that we're here to receive the word of God today, not just hear it, but to live it. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We stand on it today and every day. Thank you that you're forming of people that don't just have a Sunday morning faith, but that want to know what it means to follow you every single day, that wanna know what it means to enjoy their life. And God, I just ask as we open up the scriptures today that you would just make it plain in such a way where not only can we understand it, but that we could apply it. Um, God, would you help us understand it within its context? And God, I just pray for those who walk in and maybe don't have a lot of joy or are having a hard time enjoying their life. Uh, God, today, would you give us this ability to maybe move from a place of being a victim to a place where we check ourselves and ask you to do a work in us and ask that you do a work through us. God, we ask it now in Jesus' mighty name and everybody who believed it said, come on, everybody said, amen. Hey, find somebody to give a high five, a handshake, a hug, or a kiss to. Don't kiss nobody you don't know. Well, I wanna talk around this idea of how to enjoy your relationships, because we've all had it happen, haven't we? We've all had those moments where we are enjoying our day, where things are going well. I mean, the birds are chirping, you got a smile on your face. I mean, it's a good day. You'll let people cut you off in traffic, and then it happens. Some stupid person says something stupid to you and all joy goes out the window. Right, they make one comment on Facebook. They don't like a picture on Instagram. They don't shoot you a text back. And all of a sudden, there went your joy. And I wanna talk about this idea for a second because the re reality, whether we want it or not, in order enjoy to enjoy our lives, we're gonna have to have relationships. The problem with relationships are people. Come on, touch your neighbor, tell them you're a problem. You're a problem. And in here, maybe this is just in my life, but I got a feeling you might know some people. You may be sitting next to some people. You may be in a car ride on the way home with some people. Come on, you may have some people at work tomorrow that you're gonna have to deal this with. The problem with relationships, right, is that life is full of people who I like to call killjoys. Does anybody know a killjoy in their life? I mean, these are the people that will just rob you of any sense of enjoyment, right? Like we have the people who have the hammer personality where they just gotta get their point across, they gotta say what they gotta say, they don't care who it offends, and every time you like leave, walk away from this person, you just feel horrible about yourself. Come on, raise your hand if you know a hammer. Yeah, raise your hand if you're sitting next to a hammer. All right. <laughs> Somebody's like, yeah, that's me, okay. Or, or maybe it's, it's not the hammer, but maybe 
Um, maybe you know somebody who, you, you have something good happen in your life, right? I mean, you, you could win the lottery and they're gonna be talking about how much taxes are gonna come out because their name is Debbie and Debbies are downers, hello. Y'all know, like you have a Debbie downer in your life and everything's negative, and nothing's ever good enough, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Like, it's just all the time you see them. These are the type of people um, where the lights come on the room when they walk out, you know what I'm saying? Like, the Debbie Downer, or, or I don't know about you, I talked to somebody this past week, I was after the, uh, the 11 o'clock service, and I was like, yo, um, they're not in this service, but I asked them, I was like, did you like our, our new sweatshirts? Did you like our new blue crew necks? And they looked at me, and they're like, they're not blue, they're royal. I was like, wow, okay, <laughs> right? Like, this is, the, this is the nitpicker, you know? Anybody got nitpickers in your life, right? Like, you're like, oh, the store's just two miles down the road, and they're like, no, it's not, it's 2.6 miles down the road, you know? Like, it's the nitpicker, right? Or, or maybe you got a volcano where, you know, it doesn't matter like how the mood in the room is. If, if you say one thing with like the wrong tone in your voice, they're just ready to explode and burn everybody around them, right? Or you got the garbage collector where it's like you get a DM on Instagram talking about 20 years ago, you skipped me in middle school line at lunch and you got the last pizza and I'm still mad about it, right? Like it's just, you know what I'm saying? Like they never let anything go. Like you, you haven't seen them in 10 years and then you see them and they just still look mad at you. Right, like that's the, the garbage collector. Or, or, you know, you got all of these people, right, that are, are killjoys. And, and the, the challenging part about that is they're unavoidable. Because most of our tendency, right, like when you have to deal with people like this, you, you tend to isolate yourself. You're like, I don't want nothing to do with people like that. They're always killing the joy. They're always just bringing this dark cloud around them. And so what do we do? We like to isolate ourselves. Like we, we just like, you know what? I'm not gonna deal with people. Like I'll come to church. I'll sit around people, but I'm not gonna get involved with people. You, you, you isolate yourself like, no, I'm not gonna enjoy, I'm not gonna get in a small group. I'm not gonna volunteer. You know, I'm not gonna do life with people outside of Sunday morning because people suck and I don't feel like dealing with them. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Or you don't isolate yourself, but you, you react. And when that killjoy, when that, when that volcano, when that nitpicker, when that Debbie Downer says something, you just cannot help but to say something back. That's my personality, right? And what's interesting about that is the very people that you claim to kill your joy, you become like. The very people that like you hate when they got something to say. They always got something to say. You never can get a word in. They always got something to say on Facebook. You make one comment about how good Jesus is and they're like, is Jesus really real? You know what I'm saying? Like there was a, a reel this week on Instagram and I was talking about how Jesus is so much better at, at forgiving you than you are at failing. Can I get an amen? He's so much better at saving than you are at sinning. And this guy comments, he's like, did Jesus actually tell you that? I'm like, yeah, when he rose from the dead, bro, chill. You know what I'm saying? Like you just, you got these people, right? And, and the problem is, is like, if you're not careful, the very thing that you hate, you will become like. <laughs> and one person on Facebook that you don't even know You've been friends with because you've got to have a lot of friends and you always accept everybody that sends you friend requests even though they're weird. You don't even know them. They make one comment and it affects you so much that you will go home and you will take it out on your spouse, be impatient with your kids, all because of one person you barely know stole your joy. And what I want to do is talk about how do we actually have good relationships? And I think it starts with realizing that it starts with me. That maybe, just maybe, they're not the only problem. Maybe I gotta check myself if I'm gonna learn how to enjoy my life. Because here's the truth, the people you're saying kill your joy, they're probably not the thing killing your joy. You are. You know why? Because your joy is not their job. Your joy is your job. And so maybe, just maybe, like here's the temptation today. The temptation is you hear this sermon and you're gonna be thinking, oh man, I wish my nephew was here. Oh, I wish my friend was here. Oh, I wish they would have gotten up. I'm gonna share this message online. And that's fine, share it, but maybe, just maybe, we can take the spotlight off of everybody else for a second and just maybe let the spotlight of the Holy Spirit look into our own hearts and allow us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Yeah, maybe we can just go, you know what? I'm gonna pray Psalm 139. God, search me and know my heart. See if there's any anxious thoughts. Examine me and lead me to the place of everlasting. Maybe just maybe we can take a look at ourselves and maybe that will be the key to us actually enjoying our life because life can be summed up in one word 
in its relationships. And what I love about this, this, this chapter two of the book of Philippians is in chapter one, Paul kind of opens up with this overview or this big idea about joy and how to have it and what it looks like in suffering when things don't go your way and how God is actually working it out of the things that he started, he will finish. Can I get it a good amen? So he gives us this picture, but then he goes to the next thing right off chapter two. And he says, I'm gonna focus on the thing that will cause you to either enjoy your life or not enjoy your life, and it's relationships. And so I just wanna talk about today, how do we have healthy relationships? And here's why. Because the quality of your relationships will determine the quantity of your joy. And so how do we actually have quality, God-honoring, life-giving relationships? So here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna walk verse by verse through chapter two, and it's amazing what will happen when together, I'm just gonna make some observations out loud and see how we can together check ourselves and, and take some steps forward, amen? So here's number one, write this down. If you want to enjoy your life, come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them you gotta check your motives. Come on, check your motives. <laughs> Nobody wants to be friends with. Nobody wants to be in relationship with people who have ulterior motives who's always trying to sell you something, always trying to sign you up for something, like can't have a conversation without trying to make an ask. And I love what Paul says right off the get in verse three and four, he says this. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, what does he say? Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests. So not what can I get out of this thing, but each of you to the interest of others. So let me find out how I can actually serve other people. And the key word there, if you have a Bible, you wanna write this down, underline it. One of the keys of this entire chapter is that one word, humility. Now we've heard this definition before, but humility, what is it? It's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. I like to define humility this way. It's not ignoring my strengths, but it's getting honest about my weaknesses. Listen, you are never more like Satan than when you're prideful. And you are never more like Jesus than when you're humble. He says, if you wanna enjoy your relationships, you're gonna have to check your motives. Because we've all had those moments, right? Where people, they, they invite you over to the, your, their house. They seem excited. They want to get to know you, and, and you go, right? And you're so, you're so excited to finally find some friendships, you know, outside of work or find some godly friendships where you think, oh, we're going on the same path, and, and we value the same things, and you show up. There's nothing worse. There's nothing that will take your joy more than somebody with the wrong motives. You know, like you get in there, and all of a sudden, you think they're going to pull out some food, and what do they do? They pull out some saran wrap trying to wrap your body in some lotion talking about it works. You know what I'm saying? And like... I don't care what, it, it, it works to get the sale, but it does not work in friendships. Why? Because you got wrong motives, right? We, we can't stand that, and it's ruined relationships. Now, let me pause and say, if you are like in multi-marketing and pyramid schemes and all that, listen, no hate, I'm not hating, okay? I'm not, I'm not hating, do your thing, boo-boo. Like, I used to sell Cutco, okay? But listen, understand, understand, just don't call it relationships. Like, make your money, Provide for your family, be generous, that's awesome. But can we please just leave the weirdness out of it? And when people come to your house, can you stop trying to sell them something and worrying about yourself, but rather maybe just maybe actually value the person themselves? Right, like we get these weird, so listen, I'm just gonna tell you, if you join our group and somebody's trying to sell you something, just give me a call, you know what I'm saying? Just, hey, that's not them, right? And let me tell you why. Because you were created to love people and use things. You were not created to love things and use people. And so many of us, right, like this is what we do. We don't actually love people, we use people. So I'll be friends with that girl because I like the guys she's hanging out with. Or I will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll befriend my coworker because I know they're in with the boss and so I'll befriend my coworker not because I care about my coworker but because I could actually get a promotion if I do. Or hey, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up to serve and I'll make you think that I'm doing it for the right reason, but I'm not actually doing it to serve people, I'm doing it because I want a job. 
And so you know how I know those people? Because when I put somebody and elevate them above them, they get real mad and they leave. It's like, I thought it was about serving people. But, but see, we, we have these moments, right, where our motives aren't pure and we don't really love people. We love things and we use people. And I think it's time that we actually learn how to have a quality relationship and leave the selfishness at the door. You know what selfishness is, right? It's when you put your agenda on somebody else. When you have the wrong motive and, and he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Why? Because that is not gonna help you enjoy your relationships. It's gonna be how you kill them. There's nothing worse than somebody with the wrong motive. And let me just say this because I know you might think I'm picking on you. Um, raise your hand if you're type A in the house. If you're, you got a type A personality, you're, this is the worst for us, by the way. I'm a type A. And so listen, if you're type A, look at me. You need to be very careful at this. Because if you're not careful, you will have your to-do list, your goals, your achievements, all of that stuff, and you will see people as a means to an end to accomplish your goal. And so you'll see people as projects instead of people as people. Like you'll just look at people and go, do I wanna befriend you? And the reason you're really befriending them is because they can get you to where you wanna go. And so you just gotta be really careful. And here's why I say that, because I'm just checking myself. Because when I'm in relationships with people, I got a lot to do. I got a lot of things I wanna accomplish. I am a goal setter. And listen, if that's you, there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that's a God-given gift. But I think we should learn how to use that gift in the way that 1 Peter 4 says. And he says, each of you should use your gifts that God has given you to what? To serve people, not use people. And so we just gotta learn how to figure out, okay, God is giving me this ability. I'm influential with my words. I know how to capture people. And that's fine, make your money, do your thing. But listen, don't do it at the expense that it kills every relationship in your life. Can I get an amen? amen? Aren't you thankful that Jesus came with the right motives? Aren't you thankful that it wasn't a bait and switch? Aren't you thankful that he didn't come trying to bait and switch you and sell you something and make you come to him, but rather he came down for you? Come on, is anybody thankful that Jesus came with the right motives? So turn to your neighbor, tell him, check your motives. Here's the second thing. Your mama used to say this to you. Your grandmama used to say this to you. If you wanna enjoy your life, you gotta check your attitude. Yeah, you gotta check your tude. Check your attitude. I love what Paul says in verse five. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I love the, the NLT version. It says that you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Can you imagine <laughs> Can you imagine if Jesus had our attitude today? Like, yo, can you imagine like if Jesus woke up on the side of the bed that some of y'all woke up on this morning? Everybody would be dead. He would have struck everybody dead. The disciples wouldn't have had no shot. Like if he had my attitude this morning, some of y'all would be dead coming up in here, right? Like, but aren't you thankful that he doesn't have our attitude? Aren't you thankful that he doesn't act and treat people the way we act and treat people. I've just found that like the majority of your arguments, the majority of my arguments, really just come down to having a bad attitude. Let me tell you what causes the most fights in my marriage. My wife having a bad attitude. I'm just kidding. <laughs> like it can be summed up by like somebody waking up on the wrong side. At the end of the day, watch. Most of the time your problems come from you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Somebody says something you didn't like. Somebody didn't meet an expectation you set, and eventually it bothered you so much that you took it out on the person you love. And that's what happens. It really comes down to a bad attitude. So I'm like, well, you don't really know my family. It's impossible to have a good attitude. Listen, it is impossible for you to have a bad relationship if you got a good attitude. And the reverse is true. It's impossible for you to have a good relationship if you got a bad attitude. I'm telling you, like, all of your relational problems probably can be fixed with your attitude. Not their attitude, your attitude. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, check yourself. Check yourself, check yourself. Jesus didn't have that attitude. In fact, it says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to what? His own advantage. But rather, what did he do? Being in very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Listen, if anybody had the right to have a bad attitude, it was Jesus. 
if anybody had the right to pay people back, oh, it was Jesus. If anybody has been hurt by his family, if anybody had been hurt by his friends, if anybody had the right to live offended, it was Jesus. But aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't live his life offended, but he lived his life obedient? And instead of getting even, he got lower and he humbled himself to love people who got a bad attitude, that have a wrong mentality like you and me. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the mindset and the attitude of Jesus. I mean, there's this moment in scripture where he could have got even, right? Like it's the night he's getting betrayed by one of the men that he asked to follow him. Get that? This was somebody who followed him for three years. And this very person who was in his inner circle, one of his closest friends, betrays him. It's the moment where Jesus gets betrayed by a man named Judas. And Judas is like, hey, I'm gonna show you a sign. He's got an army full of men with him with clubs, with swords. And he says, I'm gonna kiss the one that's Jesus because they don't know who Jesus is. All the disciples are standing around and here comes Judas. And as he walks up to Jesus to betray him, Jesus says this to him, watch. Do what you came for, friend. Whew. The moment Jesus gets betrayed by Judas, he called him friend. And so he kisses him and, and they arrest Jesus. And then this guy named Peter gets mad about it. He forgot to check his attitude. And what does he do? He grabs a sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. <laughs> I just imagine Jesus looking at Peter like, bro, check your attitude, Malchus, here's your ear back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Peter forgot to check his attitude. Peter's like, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to defend. What's interesting about Jesus is that he doesn't defend himself at all. If anybody had the right to defend himself, it was Jesus. And then he says, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Let's make that practical. For those of you who have a tendency to get back at people, do you realize that when you get back at people, you're actually hurting yourself? When you use your tongue as a weapon, don't be surprised when it ends up ruining your life. So then he says, do you think that I can't call on my father and he'll at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how would that, the scriptures be filled that if it happens this way? And then he says, in the hour Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me, but all this is taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. So Jesus is like, I could get back at you. I have the authority to get back at you. It wouldn't be wrong of me necessarily to get back at you. I have the power to tell God to send down angels and burn your tail up. But he says, but I'm not going to. And then here's what's interesting. They arrest Jesus, but what do the disciples do? Last verse, all the disciples deserted him and fled. If anyone had the right to be offended, it was Jesus. And yet, instead of living offended, he stayed obedient. Instead of canceling you, he calls you by name. Instead of walking out from you, he walks towards you and says, if you will put your faith in me, I will transform your attitude. Can I get a good amen? Come on, you gotta check your motives, you gotta check your attitude. Jesus has this healthy, God-honoring mindset. And I would just say, imagine what could happen if you let him transform yours. What would happen in your relationships? How much more joy you would have if you would just learn to check your attitude. Can we go deeper? Because the mentality and, and mentality and attitude, like that's the fruit of something that is the root. And here's the root. If you want to enjoy your life, you got to check your spiritual health. This right here, this right here is so important. And it's why we, we gave out these last week. And so we got a copy of them online. There, there's probably none left at this point. It's why we're studying his word every single day. Because I'm telling you, your relationships with people are a byproduct of your relationship with God. This is why Paul, right off the get, he goes, let me tell you something. This is the root issue. And if you forget to do this one, you'll never get the other ones right. 
He says, therefore, my dear friends, verse 12, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how, now much more in my absence, he says, continue to work out your, say your, salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is a very controversial verse because people have used it to manipulate and make people live in fear rather than living in the grace and truth of the gospel, knowing that God who began a good work in you will see it to the, care, to the, to the completion of all time. That when you are saved, God deposits his Holy Spirit inside of you. And this verse does not mean that he withdraws it from you. But what he is getting to in the context of what is being preached is relationships. He's saying, you, you, you wanna have healthy relationships? Focus on your spiritual health. Work out whose salvation? Your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Listen, some of us are having a hard time in our relationships and there's always friction because every time you try to invest into your marriage and do better, try harder, every time you try to invest into your kids and make your time more purposeful, every time you try to share your faith at work, Every time you try to show people that you really have changed and you're not who you used to be, the, the reason we tend to fall short and the reason we end up failing is really coming down to the point that you are trying to give people something that you have not yet received. And so you give people your anger, you give people your bitterness, you give people your resentment, you end up being a killjoy, not because that's your desire, but because you haven't yet learned how to enjoy your life in him. You haven't really worked out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I'm just, I'm telling you, listen, your relationships with people are a byproduct of your relationship with God. You will not have healthy, God-honoring relationships with people and have a unhealthy relationship with your heavenly father. I'm telling you, when you get this right, watch what will happen. You'll start to get this right. Parents, listen to me. The best thing you can do for your kids is not buy them more things. It's not to take them on more trips. It's not to just use empty words of affirmation. All that's great. But parents, listen, the best thing you can do for your kids is have a healthy marriage. We know that, we get that. Here's what we miss though. The greatest thing you can give your spouse is your relationship with God. What your kids need is to see a healthy marriage. What your spouse needs is to see a healthy you, a healthy, God-honoring relationship with your heavenly Father, because if you do not have this, this will always get depleted. They cannot fill your life. They cannot give you a joy that will withstand pain. This is why when things are good in the relationship, things are good. But the moment something happens you didn't expect, all joy goes out the window because you forgot to check your spiritual health. I have, this, um, I have this friend, or I should say this person, you may have somebody like this, um, that, I, that, I, that I deal with on a consistent basis that's a killjoy. If you have a killjoy in your life, will you just lift your hand like somebody who just gets on your lap? Okay, I'm talking to somebody. I mean, this is like all of them wrapped in one. I mean, it's the Debbie Downer, it's the volcano, it's the nitpicker, it's the garbage. I mean, it doesn't matter. Every day I get all versions, okay? And what's interesting about our relationship is I can be having the best day. And when I'm around this person for more than 10 minutes, I will completely go negative. I'm just, they're not in here, y'all relax. They're no longer with us, okay? Not like they died, they're just not in the room, okay? And so every day, I mean, if I'm with this person, six hours later, I can go home and my wife will go, did you hang out with blank today? And I'm like, I did. I was like, how'd you know? She's like, cause you're completely different. Some of y'all are finding way too much joy in this <laughs> sermon. And let me tell you what I did for a long time. I thought they were the problem and I blamed them. They're the nitpicker, they're the garbage collector. They're the crybaby, they're the downer, they're the hammer. And let me just remind you, you might wanna check yourself because your joy is not their job, your joy is your job. 
And so as I began to check myself, what I began to realize is I was blaming them for the lack of joy in my life, but neglected to understand how many times I had been a crybaby with God of things he gave me that I asked them for. It just didn't look like I thought. Like how many times I've been the nitpicker. Like, God, you answered the prayer, but not this little part of it. I've been the garbage collector, and I bring up 10 years ago of pain and forget about the goodness of God over the last 10 years of my life. And so here's what happens. When I check myself and I go, God, what's my relationship with you look like? And I see his compassion and his mercies every day towards me. It makes it possible for me to actually show compassion and grace towards that person. And so now the relationship has transformed, not because God changed them, but because God changed me. And y'all, I think we just gotta start there. This is what Jesus talks about when he says, when you see the, the sawdust in your brother or sister's eye, first remove the plank from your own. I think we gotta just go, you know what? I'm gonna stop blaming everybody else. I'm gonna check myself because whether we like to admit it or not, there's two versions of you. And I know that because I'm gonna be real with you. There's two versions of me. There's two different Cody Woodards. There's the Cody that I hope you see. It's the Cody that spends time with Jesus, has a smile on his face, loves his wife, plays with his kids after work, is kind to his, to his staff members, who's good looking. Come on, somebody. Who, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. Humility, humility, humility. Um, who, listen, listen, y'all know what I'm talking about. When I spend time with Jesus, I can, be sitting in, I can be sitting in traffic for an hour and you can cut me off and I'm like, praise God for you, you got somewhere to go. Y'all know what I mean? Like nothing's taking that for, like I, it's just, it's that Cody. That's the Cody I want people to see. But can I just tell you, that's not the one he, everybody gets. Like my spouse will tell you, my wife will tell you, that is not the Cody I see at home every day. My staff will tell you that is not the Cody that comes into the office every day. Because the Cody that doesn't spend time with Jesus is the Cody that's rude, that's short-tempered, that will, that will use you to get his agenda done. Let's be honest. That, that, will, that's, that, that won't have time to play with his kids, that will work himself to de death to accomplish a goal. You know what I've learned to do? When people I know have really big hearts but bad habits, and I see it consistently happen, I've just learned to ask them this question. Yo, when's the last time you spent time with Jesus? You may tell you why I asked that question? Because your relationships with other people is always a byproduct of your relationship with Jesus. And the reason we get disconnected from each other is because we're disconnected from God. And so we're trying to teach you how to have a, a Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Friday night faith. And Saturday, can't leave out Saturday. Some of y'all be tripping on Saturdays. But here's then what he says. When we think this way, he gives us some practical advice. He says, do everything, say everything, without grumbling or arguing. Okay, you can go home now, bye, right? Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God in a warped and crooked generation. And he says this, and then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold fast to the word of life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the person where the lights come on when I walk out. I wanna be the type of person that when I walk into the room, it makes the room get a little bit lighter because they see Jesus on my life. He says, you'll shine among them like stars in the sky. You'll make a difference. You'll, you'll be the seed of Abraham that God prophesied about in Genesis 15. When he said, go out, look at the heavens, look at the stars, so will be your descendants that honor me. Don't you wanna be a, a light in the world? Don't you wanna be somebody? When people look at you, they don't think kill joy, but they think of somebody who knows how to enjoy life. I'm telling you that the key for you to be that type of person is directly connected with God. We gotta check our motives, we gotta check our attitude, we gotta check our spiritual health. And then finally, here's what I want you to check last. I want you to check your intentionality. Check your intentionality. And let me tell you why. Because enjoying your life does not happen by accident. It happens intentionally. And what happens, Paul is such a great example of this in his letters. 
as he ends these letters, he does something almost every, every letter he writes. He gets intentional about his relationships. He's not just writing to a crowd. He is speaking to an individual and he goes like this. He says this in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. When people talk about me, I want them to think about me like the, Paul thinks about Timothy. That man, I'm gonna send you somebody in your life. Man, he's not looking out for his own interest. He's looking out for you. He's there for you. He cares about you. Here's one of my life goals, and you might wanna make it one of yours. I want the people who know me the best to respect me the most. Because I wanna be the same on Sunday as I am on Monday. And I think it's time for some of us to close the gap between who we are at work and who we're at in church. Who we are behind closed doors and who we are in front of people, who we are on a platform and who we are in a prayer closet. We got to con connect the dots between the two if we're actually gonna teach people how to enjoy their life, amen? Come on, stand your feet with me. I wanna, I wanna close and say this. He's so intentional. Maybe we should get intentional with our, our people, our relationships, and, 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 and listen, I told you this message was check yourself, which simply means that enjoying your life, it starts with you. It starts with you. Checking your spiritual health, checking your motives, checking your attitude, checking your intentionality and your relationships. And I can say that because that's how Jesus lived. He said, I, I'm gonna go first. Let it start with me. Aren't you thankful that he didn't look at you with your bad attitude, your wrong motives, your bad mentality, disconnected from him and said, work your way up to me. When you get your act together, we can be in relationship. When you get your mentality fixed, then I can get to know you. Aren't you thankful that Jesus said, no, I'm gonna let it start with me. I'm gonna leave heaven, I'm gonna come to earth and I'm gonna love people, not cancel people. I'm gonna serve people, not just, not just treat people like crap. I'm gonna love people who have failed to love me because that's who I am, that's what I do and that's what you and I are called to do if we're gonna enjoy our life, amen? Come on, if you're thankful for this message today, can we just thank God for his word? So I wanna pray for two groups of people, and this is the moment a lot of times, don't leave, just pause for a second, two groups of people. Some of you have a relationship with God, but you don't enjoy your life, especially in this area of relationships. You got friction, you got issues, you got problems with people, you blamed them for too long, you deal with your motives being correct. You wonder if theirs is correct. If that's you, I wanna pray for you. And we're just gonna pray this honest prayer of like, God, will you start with me? Will you search me? So will you pray with me? And uh, as everybody bows their head, if that's your prayer today and you go, hey God, I know you, but man, I need to check myself. We just lift your hand towards heaven. Say, God, I need your help in relationships. I need, I need you. I need you to give me your mentality. I need you to give me your attitude towards these people. I need you to make me like your son. I trust you in my relationships. Help me enjoy them. Help me be a person who shines like stars in the sky so people can see my good works, but glorify you and not me. We pray that in Jesus' name. You can put your hands down. I wanna pray for others of you who've never started with God, who've tried to enjoy your relationships with people and you wonder why they never work and it's because you're giving people something you have not yet received. What God says is that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever believes in their heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that God raised him from the dead on the third day will be saved and his spirit will be placed inside of you, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is the spirit that encourages us today. So if that's your prayer today, you need to know you can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can't serve it, you can't work it. And the good news of the gospel is you don't have to because Jesus already did that for you. Who humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that people like you and I who are far from God could be made righteous 
and back in relationship with him. If that's you today, and today you wanna give your life to Christ, I'm gonna pray, and as we're praying, you just throw up your hand. No one's gonna call you out by name, not gonna embarrass you, but if you're going, this is my prayer for the first time, I'm, I'm coming to God, or maybe today you're rededicating, and you're going, God, I want more of you. I've, I've fallen off the path, but today I wanna rededicate my life. If that's you, we're gonna pray this out loud for the benefit of those who are saying that today so that you can know you're not alone. So church, pray this with me. Say, today, I give you my life. I believe she died for me. She rose from the grave so that I could be forgiven and set free. Help me check myself. If that was your prayer today, we just shoot your hand up right now. Every head bowed, eyes still closed while hands going up everywhere. Come on. Father, I thank you for every hand lifted. Wow. Oh man, God, I just pray that they would know how much you love them. Save them right now in this moment from their sin. Set them free from their past so they can learn to enjoy their life right now. We love you so much. Thank you for your salvation, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray, everybody said. Come on, put your hands together for those who said yes to Jesus today. Hands all over the room.